Are you thinking of retiring before the age of 60? This can sound like a really exciting goal for so many, but far too often they don't have a clear roadmap of how to get there, where they're currently at, or what actions need to be taken to actually achieve this goal of retiring or achieving financial independence before the age of 60. So in this video, I'm going to share with you 10 simple tips, simple steps that you can take to ensure that you can retire comfortably before the age of 60. So let's dive right in. Hi there, Jared Brown here, Australian expat financial planner here in Singapore. Today I'm sharing with you 10 tips to retire before the age of 60. Now some of them will be simple, but often it's the simple steps that get ignored and get in the way of us achieving these retirement goals. So number one is setting clear goals that are broken down into bite-sized steps. Now, what this means is really defining where we are now, where we need to be, so we really need to run some numbers. Now, in this scenario, you can use things like the 4% rule, meaning that if we want a retirement income of $100,000 per year, by the time we hit age 60 or 50 or 55, then we can divide that 100,000 by 4% to work out that we need $2.5 million to get there to generate that income consistently when we retire. Now, if we know that we need 2.5 by 60 and we're currently 45, we know that we have 15 years to get there. Or we might want to retire by 55 and therefore we have 10 years to get there. So we can therefore then work out, which brings us to tip number two, where we currently are and how we are going to get to that end goal, where we need to be by the end of each and every year. So number two is really defining where we currently stand. So use Excel, use a sheet of paper, back of a napkin, whatever works for you, use your financial software if that's what you're using or QuickBooks or Xero, whatever suits you to get a clear snapshot of where your finances currently sit. So this is bringing all of your financial assets together, all of your financial liabilities together to get a sense of your net asset position. Now your net assets is calculated by taking away the total liabilities from your total assets. Now it's important to note these, these should be things that are financial assets and not lifestyle assets. Meaning that if your home is included, but you're going to live in this property, well, it almost doesn't matter if it goes up, down or sideways in value because we're not gonna use that asset to produce any of that retirement income. Similarly, if we have artwork or other contents that we can't sell or, or won't be selling and won't generate an income, then again, we should probably exclude these things, perhaps track them separately, but they're unlikely to assist with our retirement income planning. So this is a good idea once you build that template, create that net asset framework to track this every six or 12 months to again work out, are we on track with the goals that we set in tip number one? So that's number two, defining where we currently sit in terms of our asset position. Let's move on to number three. Now, number three is arguably one of the most simple steps, and that is simply starting a savings plan that works regularly, whether it's via direct debit or gyro, into an investment portfolio that makes sense for you. Now, by that, I mean we need to think through future tax implications, should we invest here in Singapore? Should we invest in our superannuation back in Australia? Should we be paying down debt on investment property or our future main residence? Or even putting funds into a term deposit? There is no one size fits all. It's all about assessing how much risk am I prepared to take on? How long do I have to get there? And therefore, where should that money be going? And quite often diversification is key rather than putting all of that money into our Singapore savings or into our property, diversifying across the different assets is going to be quite beneficial over the long run. So that's number three, not just setting up the savings plan, but maintaining the discipline to keep it going over time. Now, number four is reducing debt. Now, with this one, we wanna be careful and quite strategic 
about which debts we reduce first. So a good way to start is create a list of all of, all of the debts, all of the liabilities that you have, list them from the most expensive to the cheapest debt first. I would also suggest you make a note around what's tax deductible and what's not, because that is ultimately going to impact the net effective tax rate or net effective interest rate that we're paying on each of those debts. So once we've got that list, you can either pay it down in a logical manner, meaning we get rid of the most expensive debt first. So that's usually going to be things like credit cards, store cards, buy now, pay later, all of this that really has no security sitting behind it. These are personal loans or bad debts as they're commonly known. This is what we want to get rid of first. For some people, they prefer to use the snowball method of paying down debt, which means we get rid of the smallest debts first to build that momentum and keep us on track. Again, there is no one size fits all. The former makes more sense financially, but if building that momentum is what's going to drive more activity and productivity for you, then naturally use that snowball method to get rid of those debts. So that's number four. Number five is diversification. Now I've touched on this already, but diversifying across different asset classes and different ownership structures is often going to be what stands the test of time. So by this, I mean not just investing in property or just in shares, but across all of the asset classes cash, bonds, shares and property in the right allocations that make sense for you. And then considering the ownership structures that sit above those. So how much into super? Should we set up a family trust? Should we set up an insurance bond to invest some of our money in while we are living and working overseas? How much should go into our own name or joint names or company structures or whatever else might make sense for us? So these are the important things to consider. And as I said, diversifying across both asset classes and holding structures will often be the most beneficial in time. Number six is planning for healthcare. Now, healthcare is naturally quite expensive and naturally it makes up a decent portion of most people's retirement spending back in Australia. Now, our public healthcare system in some pockets of the country is excellent and some pockets probably the opposite of that, can be very difficult to access, very difficult to get an appointment, and probably not what we want to be reliant on if we don't have to be. But by planning for this, making sure that we've got the right health cover in place, we're not paying an arm and a leg for it, whether that means suspending our Australian health insurance while we're overseas, reactivating it where we need to and then resuspending, or maybe it means retaining our international health insurance once we go back to Australia and keeping that in place going forward. Whichever it may be, review your options, but make sure that it's factored into your expenses. The next one is simply monitoring and adjusting as needed. Now, this does not mean cashing in all of our shares because the world's ending, it's the next economic crisis, there's blood on the street, you're reading the press, and the doomsayers are out in force. All this means is that if our plans adjust, if our plans change, we want to retire earlier or later, or we want to buy a house somewhere else or spend a bit more on the home, then we need to adjust what we're doing to get there. It's also important to track, are we actually on track or do we need to make changes? The other important thing to bear in mind is that we need to rebalance investments in time. Over long enough periods of time, shares and property will often outperform bonds and cash which means that our weighting towards shares and property will increase over time. So if we want to invest as a balanced or a conservative investor, then we're going to gradually want to taper that back to bring us in line to the overall allocation that we set. So don't ignore that monitoring and checking. It doesn't mean you need to log in and check your investments every day. In fact, that's probably fraught with danger and may just lead to some terrible decisions. Often checking in every quarter or every six months even for some every 12 months can be enough to achieve the desired outcome. The next one, tip number eight, is to not ignore the tax implications of what you're doing. It's all well and good to invest, for example, in your own name while you're in Singapore. There is no capital gains tax here, nor is there tax on dividends. It doesn't get a lot better. But once we go back to Australia, we have a deemed acquisition 
and all of these shares or unit trusts or ETFs, even cash in the bank, becomes taxable from the point we re-enter Australia. So we really need to think about the long term, what structures are going to work for us and what do we need to set up by when. So certainly don't ignore the tax because at the end of the day, to quote a, a friend and colleague of mine, the only return that matters is your after tax return. Number nine is to explore part-time work and hobbies. Far too often we see people retire, they reach that age of 50 or 55 or 60 or whenever it might be when they plan to retire. And obviously if you're planning to retire prior to the age of 60, you're going to be quite young, still active, still very much able to spend money. So by thinking ahead as to what you're going to do in those retirement years, chances are your spending will be a lot more under control and a lot more predictable. Hobbies can be expensive, and if you don't have a plan with how you're going to spend all of that time, then quite often you can spend a lot more than you think. And the last thing we want is to be forced back into the workforce because we didn't manage our spending. So that's certainly an important one to explore that part-time work, what's gonna keep us busy, what's gonna give us that sense of accountability, achievement, responsibility, once we head into those retirement years. And number 10 is to simply enjoy the journey. It's all well and good to track our finances and uh, check are we on track, do we need to make changes, rebalance this, invest in that. But at the end of the day, it's important to celebrate the successes. If you are on track, you're hitting those goals, go out and celebrate. Whatever's important to you, obviously don't dip in and spend all of the money on a massive holiday, but whatever makes sense for you, whatever is an, an incentive, whatever you find rewarding, then make the time to do so. These things should be celebrated. We should enjoy the journey. It's far more about the journey than it is about the destination. So there you have it, 10 simple tips to enable you or empower you to retire before the age of 60.